Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Michael Swetnam. I'm the CEO and Chairman of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, and it's uh, my privilege to welcome you here today for an another tremendous occasion where we have the opportunity to hear from uh, one of the partners of the United States and a, a world leader on the issues surrounding uh, his country, Europe, and the United States, and the very contentious time that we're in today. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. We welcome your comments and your thoughts uh, following this session. And as always, we're very privileged to be associated with you as you embark upon studying these issues and helping expand our understanding of the challenges that face the United States and the rest of the world. I want to thank uh, uh, General Dave Reist and Professor Yona Alexander for pulling together this tremendous session and for continuing the scholarship that addresses these issues. It's very, very important and a critical part of the Potomac Institute's mission that we serve as a forum for these types of uh, presentations. And once again, I thank you all for coming. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, retired Brigadier General Dave Reist, who will have a few comments and then kick the session off. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, once again, uh, welcome and thank you very much for coming today. Today's title is uh, Georgia U.S. Strategic Concept, Past Experience and Future Outlook. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, Ambassador Jakob Ashvili with us today and with him also to offer some thoughts right after me is Professor Yon Alexander, as Mike stated. You know, the tumultuous nature of the world today is, uh, is creating vacuums. And this could be good or bad, depending on the perspective, obviously. Those in control normally don't like change. One thing is certain though, change is occurring quickly and it is leading many of the uh, global powers to continually reassess relationships with other nations in order to assess what is best for either country. Natural resources, key strategic locations, ideologies that are, that are uh, similar and other elements all factor into the calculus of strategic alignment. Georgia fits squarely in these aforementioned areas. And as the uh, Arab Spring continues, and uh, methods and options of sustaining US and NATO forces in Afghanistan are looked at, the prospect of a new Silk Road is unfolding, and even overtones of a new great game are mentioned, complexity abounds. The apolitical charter of the Potomac Institute allows us to look at thorny issues such as this, and today promises to be intellectually stimulating for those on both sides of the table here today. So with that, uh, Professor Alexander, I'll turn the podium over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General. Uh, I would like to uh, join the welcome to um, the participants, uh, particularly to uh, our uh, guest speaker, the uh, ambassador of Georgia. I will uh, introduce him uh, a little bit uh, later on. Uh, we do have uh, some of the leadership, a few of the people with leadership from, uh, from the uh, Potomac. You, you met already Mike uh, Swetton. Um, we have two uh, vice uh, presidents right there, uh, Tom O'Leary back, and uh, then I think Gail Clifford, and uh, we do have uh, our uh, new team, beginning of the team of uh, researchers, uh, Pat from UCLA in the back, uh, John from Georgetown, and uh, Evan uh, also from UCLA. So uh, we are delighted to be involved in the academic work to train the next generation of uh, scholars uh, and professionals. And uh, we would like to uh, welcome the academics uh, who came to share the views with us, uh, representing the US government and uh, members of the embassy and uh, the media. Now, there is one person who is not here uh, physically, but uh, spiritually. And uh, his ambassador, David Smith, is known to many uh, of you. 
uh, is a, a senior fellow at the Potomac. He's now in Tbilisi as a center there. And uh, in <coughs> fact, uh, one, <coughs> one of the publications right here is uh, a view from Tbilisi. It keeps us uh, informed and posted in what's uh, happening in that uh, particular region. And we want to thank uh, um, David Smith for his uh, many uh, contributions to understand what's happening in that uh, very critical strategic uh, area. Now, if I may uh, make a, a personal or uh, academic uh, footnote, uh, I was um, actually very fortunate to uh, be able to study some of the uh, literature, European and Russian uh, literature, which uh, I would like to just mention uh, one uh, particular famous uh, author, Lermontov, who wrote a very famous uh, novel, uh, A Hero of Our Time, this is the English uh, translation at any rate, uh, related to the portrait of the generation, not a particular person, but the generation and uh, the human nature and so forth. But the reason why I'm mentioning that particular novel uh, because uh, it deals with uh, some travel experience in uh, Georgia. So uh, we can find a great deal of uh, literature uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, Georgia and it's a uh, very uh, extensive uh, experience uh, going back uh, to the Romans, the Persians, the Arabs, uh, the uh, Turks, uh, the Mongols, uh, the Russian Empire, and finally, finally, uh, fully independent um, <clears throat> after the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. So uh, we are really delighted uh, here to be able to discuss some of the U.S.-Georgia uh, strategic uh, relationship. Uh, General Risk already uh, mentioned some, particularly in uh, relation to Afghanistan. The general himself obviously has uh, many experiences uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth, so he knows firsthand what, uh, what's happening uh, on the ground. So we would like to find out a little bit about uh, the thinking in terms of the status of uh, the U.S.-Georgian uh, uh, relations uh, in my own uh, area, looking at the terrorist uh, threat and so forth. Uh, we, we have a great deal of uh, exchange uh, with uh, NATO, OEC, the European community in regard to uh, the position of uh, Georgia. Now, you have the um, details of uh, the ambassador uh, in, I think, your uh, package. Uh, so I'm not going to go into great uh, detail, except to indicate that uh, the ambassador presented his credential to President Barack Obama in February uh, 2011, only recently. And prior to that, uh, he served in some key positions uh, in the government, such as uh, Deputy Prime Minister and State Minister for the reintegration of uh, the government of uh, Georgia. And uh, he served also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs <coughs> for the past 20 years in a variety of senior uh, positions. And uh, what is uh, really important, I think, from our position of academic work, that he was involved in many activities in Georgia itself and around the world. And I would just mention that uh, he was a uh, co-founder and the vice president of the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies which is one of the leading uh, think tanks in the, the region. And he founded the Atlantic Council of Georgia and the Council of Foreign Relations of Georgia and so forth. And um, he also was able to make many contributions 
uh, in the United States, so uh, working uh, with uh, Harvard and Yale and uh, the continent with Oxford universities, he published extensively and he lectured throughout the world. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, if you'd like to speak from here, it would be easier. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for hosting me here. And uh, I understand that President Obama is going to speak now, so probably you should be listening to his speech. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to be as entertaining as Middle East speech. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, first of all, to be here and talk with you and share with you my personal opinion as well as the government's opinion. As it was already mentioned, I have some uh, academic background, which means that you will get from me uh, some ideas uh, between policy and politics. So I'm still having some inertia of both, and sometimes mixing up all of that, but hopefully nothing harmful is going to come out of it. Uh, when we are talking about our subject, Georgian American Strategic Partnership, uh, obviously what comes first in mind is that it's a huge uh, asymmetry in size, importance, uh, uh, population, economy, and all of that. And the first obvious question is why U.S. and Georgia should be a strategic partner? And that was a basic question that uh, I have to find answer almost every day. And so far, the best answer I have is um, very complex. And a very complex uh, answer comes not uh, from my personal thought, but from the political theories that we are all familiar with, that in foreign policy, you have three blocks of countries. You have a big countries that matter. Some of them are your friends, some of them are not your friends, but you have to deal with them. Uh, it will be European countries, uh, it will be Latin American countries, India, China. These countries matter, <coughs> Japan, even after earthquake and tsunami. And then you have countries uh, what are called frontline countries, frontline states, where you deploy your men and women in uniform, where you have some specific economic interests or specific interactions. I'm talking about uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, obviously, uh, Iraq, in certain extent, Libya, but. Obviously, for obvious reasons, you have to be focusing on those areas, for sure. And then you have a third category of countries that uh, are, in my classification as well, are named as a fault line states. Much smaller states uh, than big ones and uh, those where you conduct your operations. But uh, whatever happens in these small places, has a larger implication for the rest of the world or international affairs. And we are all familiar with the small uh, states that matter a lot, being it, uh, you know, South Korea, Israel, uh, Taiwan, even with, without recognition from the Chinese side. And Georgia, because of several reasons, became such a state, which one can consider as a curse, one can consider as a luck, uh, I personally think that it's a mixture of two. Uh, and I call Georgia a non-Las Vegas country. Whatever happens in Georgia doesn't stay in Georgia. <laughs> uh, it always has an implication, a larger implication for the rest of the region, in some cases some world affairs as well. So if you are the United States, a world power, you better handle all these three together big countries, frontline countries, and frontline countries. Now, obviously, it depends on the resources, what resources you have and what kind of world you have. And we, as we all remember, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had two dominating theories of Huntington and Fukuyama. Uh, I think that both of them made a lot of harm, personally. Uh, it was neglected, the third theory, which, was, uh, which belongs to uh, John Gaddis, from, he's a historian from Yale University, who said that uh, it is not the end of the history, it's not about clash of civilization, but next time to come, next century, will be about fragmentation and unification. 
So you will see uh, certain countries forming some unities and getting bigger, bigger and enlarging and uh, giving up some kind of their sovereignty. And we see that happening especially in the European continent against the EU. And the fragmentation. Fragmentation, how many states you have now and how many states you had uh, centuries ago, or let's say even 70 years ago. And fragmentation actually requires uh, a lot of different efforts that when the world was bipolar and you know, this was our camp, it was the other camp. And you know, there are some in between as well, but it was more simplistic world than now. And today, even in the Middle East and Northern Africa, you have so many complexities that it's very hard to draw the parallels to what happened after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union. Because yes, you had the fragmentation, Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc collapsed, and as a result of it, you got liberated states, mine included. But you have a Middle East in the turmoil, and you are not sure who, who is opposition there. So probably something very senior, uh, uh, serious and the same size as the collapse of Soviet <coughs> Union is happening in the Middle East that will have a larger implication in the world. But in the end of the day, you are not sure how it may end up. Because unlike in the Eastern Bloc, that you had countries who wanted to be you know, free, uh, secured, um, what these guys want, you are not sure. Who is opposition? You know, is it Al-Qaeda, semi-Al-Qaeda? Are they really Democrats? Uh, I recently heard uh, that some uh, scholars here in this city, rightly so, do not like the term uh, Arab Spring because it has some kind of positive connotation. And I'm not sure if that, that the good things are happening there. But what is for sure that you are engaged in a kind of fight that we in Georgia had very recently. And going back to U.S.-Georgian relations, I would uh, definitely think about three different stages of these relations. One was the collapse of Soviet Union when the West was trying to determine what to do with uh, Cold War victory or what to do with these newly uh, emerging states. Part of them uh, were sort of uh, newly created in 20th century. Uh, part of them, like mine, have uh, huge history behind. I mean, Georgian statehood goes back to 3,000 years, as well as uh, Armenian statehood, as well as uh, you know, some other countries that uh, have been on the map as a political entity for a long time. And with this kind of development, obviously, first uh, and foremost uh, priority for the United States was to identify what is happening in the world and how to handle these countries. And there were some wise people in the government, in the think tank community, who decided that the idea of Europe Hall and Free is a best serving idea to US interests. And we've seen many efforts there. And we see now many countries of former Eastern Bloc being in uh, EU and being in NATO. Second uh, wave of interest, and, but it never reached Georgia proper because uh, it was, wave was taking off from Poland and Czech Republic and going uh, eastward and it stopped somewhere in the Baltic countries. And then the post-Cold War period was ended by war of 2008. I would see it as a watershed of that development. Second wave was definitely related to energy security and energy projects. And when the idea of the revitalized uh, corridor, the Silk Road or Silk Road uh, appeared, and when uh, the world discovered that there are actually <coughs> oil resources uh, in uh, Central Asia and the Caspian <coughs> Basin that can be shipped to the West, uh, obviously, interest started to grow. And third wave uh, started in 2003, when we had the Rose Revolution in Georgia, which was followed by the Ukrainian Revolution, which was the Orange Revolution, which was followed by 
some other developments and revolutions in the, the Central Asia as well. And then the top priority, obviously, of US policy became uh, not only economic or the political issues, but very much about transformation and the nation building and switching from the failing state to uh, the functioning democracy. And uh, I can tell you that what you and us and everybody in the West wish to see in uh, Middle East and Northern Africa is some kind of Georgia. And what I mean under that. Georgia, just seven years ago, had a very funny connotation country of tribes and tribes because of uh, enormous corruption and uh, because of the fragmentation of power in the sense that you have these fiefdoms that the central government has no control. And I don't only mean the occupied territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. You had the jokes like uh, what Georgians had before candles and answer was electricity because uh, the constant blackouts, uh, just to mention that now we are net exporters of electricity. So it's all about governance. It was not about capacity. Uh, and in seven years, from failing or failed state, we became functional democracy that uh, survived war with uh, Russia, with a nuclear power survived world economic crisis, survived several domestic, very unpleasant uh, crises, and we still are here. I'm still representing a country called Georgia and representing the government of Saakashvili. So that transformation that we uh, gone through these last seven years is remarkable. It's remarkable from many points of view. Yesterday, I learned that Georgia is the safest country in Europe. And that's not what we are saying. That's what the European Union is saying. We are ranked as number one reformer uh, by the World Bank. We are number one in fighting corruption by the Transparency International. We are in the first 10 uh, 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 by uh, the index of easy to do business. And we started being 170-something. And our performance is uh, hailed not only by our friends, but our foes as well. There are many countries who are trying to model Georgian success, including Russian Federation. We are now developing a kind of political tourism when we have uh, ministers from Moldova, from Ukraine, from Armenia, from uh, Kyrgyzstan coming and learning Georgian experience. And when we are talking about experience, one thing is very important that your transformation here happened 200 years ago. European transformation happens, you know, after World War II and uh, about 20 years ago or 15 years ago we had the Central European and the East Central, uh, Eastern European countries transforming. So we are the most up-to-date carriers of the transformation knowledge. And it's not surprising that we, our delegation ended up being in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt. Because that experience of positive transformation and successful transformation is unfortunately very rare in the world. And Georgia today represents a money well spent, U.S. taxpayers' money well spent. And I can assure you, not because I'm ambassador and because I'm from Georgia, but when I was coming here, I went to my former colleagues and I asked, you know, tell me what's happening here. He said, don't quote me. That the Europeans are publishing brochures about projects and the Americans are doing the real work. So in every single ministry, you have a game-changing development as a result of American aid and as a result of American engagement. Penitentiary, education, you know, military, you name any sphere of uh, economy, of course, and others. And uh, if you go to Millennium Challenge Corporation, Georgians are the best. 
in performance. If you go to USAID, and yesterday we had a hearing uh, um, in, the, in the Senate, in the European and the Eurasian subcommittee, USAID chairmanship is saying Georgians are the best performers. So uh, we are best performers not because we are such a nice people, we are nice people by the way, but because we have a political goodwill to transform our country. And as a shining example of the US success makes our role special in US-Georgian relations. And that asymmetry that I was referring to from the beginning that, you know, size of the country, size of the population, and size of the uh, uh, you know, economy in these kind of issues doesn't matter because we are not only a successful case of transformation and one event spent, but we are also ones who are the largest per capita contributors in Afghanistan. And we are not the sunshine soldiers there. We are in helmet. We are fighting with you. We are not building schools or kindergartens or repairing roofs. We are with your men and women in uniform, you know, on real fights. Unfortunately, we, as you sustained some casualties already, we have seven men uh, you know, killed and uh, around 30 something wounded. But it's not a holiday, it's a war. And we understand that that war matters for us a lot. And the people are saying, oh, you are fighting there because you want to get some guns from us against Russians. Stupid notion. We are there because we have a stake in the success of the West. Because, because if the West is failing, then what the hell we are joining? And we want to be part of the successful West. Uh, and for us, NATO is the best solution of our security problem. And if NATO is failing in Afghanistan, then what are we joining? So you have this complexity of uh, relationship when you have oil and gas pipeline that matters, when you have a democratic transformation that matters, and you have a security cooperation that matters a lot. And I think uh, that in future it will be more and more relevant. So I don't really have a crystal ball, but you know the think tankers pretend to be a self-appointed wise man. <coughs> I'm talking about myself. Uh, and um, all of us are trying to predict the future. And I can tell you that I don't know what the future will look like and what the currency will be uh, you know, used in 2022nd century, but most likely dollar. But I can tell you that the importance of Georgia strategically is growing, not diminishing. Because complexity of the world affairs is not matched by the complexity of international institutions. We understand that post-Cold War institutions are not adequate for the complexity of the today's world. And it's not surprising that the individual states lack that complexity as well, especially when you also lack some financial resources for that. So a lot of criticism to the United States comes why Americans are not doing this, why Americans are not doing that, because Americans just cannot and don't have that kind of capacity. And we all understand that, you know, we want to see Americans uh, everywhere and doing all the right things, but uh, there are limitations. We understand these limitations as well. America is too big and too powerful. It can make mistakes and will be suffering from these mistakes. And uh, one, my job is here is to ensure that that mistake will not happen on our part of the world, or we will not be neglected because of somebody getting busy in other places. And we all understand that uh, there are so many places that matter today that this complexity, lack of capacity to address the complexity may be a serious challenge. You may uh, be surprised that I never mentioned the word Russia. Uh, Russia is significant only now, and Russia will not be significant in, let's say, 20 years. Because if you look from Russia from the West, it's a scary country. If you look at Russia from the East, it's a degrading power. And we have so many 
signs of the degradation of Russia. And especially looking from Georgia, you see much more than you see from Brussels. And our idea is to have a normal partnership relation with our normal partner neighbor. But they it's a two-way street. They have to get normal, and they have to get in the mood of partnership. So far, they are not either one or the second. It's very sad. And uh, I'm not hell of the optimistic about the reset 2.0, because all low-hanging fruits are already collected. And I don't predict that there will be some shining you know, love between uh, US and uh, Russia in the years to come. <coughs> yes, 20% uh, of our territories are occupied. Yes, uh, we are under everyday threat of uh, Russian invasion or reinvasion. Uh, but at the same time, we learned that we better be focused on our development than, uh, you know, being focused on demonizing Russians, especially when everybody knows who they are and what they do and how they do. Our top priorities here are first to change the narrative about Georgia. And Georgia is much more than Misha Russia dialogue. Misha, I mean, Georgian President Sarkashvili. To find the security guarantees for Georgia, being it in NATO, being in multilateral uh, arrangement, being in, in bilateral arrangements, or in uh, uh, credible defense capabilities, and you don't know what that might mean, and uh, implementing something that we already have in place. It's called Georgian American Strategic Charter. And that charter addresses all important areas. And what I like in America is not only what you write. People care what you do, not only what you say and you write, but what you do and how you do. And I think what we learned, one of the things that we learned is it's not enough to only talk and write, but you also have to act. And I don't want to be remembered as an ambassador that people would say, yeah, we know that he was working, but we are not sure if he was achieving. I want to achieve, and I want to achieve very concrete and tangible results in all these three areas. And I think that academic community, uh, opinion shapers, are very important ingredient of this process. I'll stop here, otherwise I'll be talking in another two hours, and we'll be glad to satisfy your curiosity in Q&A session. Thank you. underscore the, the need uh, for uh, cooperation rather than confrontation. Let me begin asking you uh, one, uh, one question and then we'll open up uh, a discussion with the audience. Um, in, in your uh, post uh, as um, basically trying to, to develop uh, the integration uh, in the region, uh, what I have in mind is, uh, I think, one of the major challenges uh, <clears throat> to, to all nations is uh, separatism. And uh, the, uh, your, your efforts for the uh, reintegration of the Caucasus, how, how do you see the uh, situation today uh, in terms of some, some of the implications <laughs> So not only uh, regional, but uh, also global from your uh, experience working in this field. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting question, uh, which I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, again, uh, we uh, are experiencing what I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation versus, you know, uh, enlargement and cooperation. And while the European Union was getting bigger and bigger, we saw 
so-called separatists in the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union as well. What I want to tell you that separatism is not something that is unknown in the world, and I don't want to go into the European countries that uh, suffer from it, starting from Italy and from the Great Britain. Uh, and we know that there are minorities in many other European countries who are members of EU and NATO, and uh, they are asking for special treatment. That's nothing new, and it's nothing scary. Because the difference between separatists and terrorists is that you can negotiate with separatists something. And uh, in Georgian case, we found two groups of separatists, actually much more than it melted down to two groups. And instead of uh, giving a possibility to Georgians to negotiate with them, what we've seen is a very brutal intervention in the Georgia's inter uh, internal affairs. and using separatists and separatism against the Georgian state. So what happened in 2008, it was a manifestation that the Georgia's problem was not separatist per se, but the Georgia's problem was Russian Federation, who was using, among other methods, the separatists and separatism against our statehood. Now, uh, this is very important to understand that this was primarily Georgia-Russia conflict because if you have a wrong diagnosis, you can really uh, give a right prescription. And if person is bleeding and you go and say, oh, you look pale, you should take an aspirin or you have a headache. Yes, he's pale, he has a headache, but aspirin is not going to help because it's bleeding. And in our case, when we were bleeding, we were told, oh, you have a separatist problem. It's horrible. You should go and negotiate with Abkhaz and Ossetians. And Abkhaz and Ossetians were coming and saying, what are we going to say if we have a big brother watching us? So you cannot cure uh, you know, pneumonia with a diarrhea medicine. And right diagnosis is very important in handling the problem. Because separatism is an internal problem of the state. And Georgia-Russian war is an external problem. And methodology to handling, uh, these are two different sorts of problems by nature. And methodology you employ are completely different. So now we end up with a two-layer problem when we have international problems with Russian Federation. And the second layer is a separatist problem. We are ready to handle both. but. Without getting rid of first problem, you cannot even handle the second because it's impossible. Because uh, unless there are some alternative security guarantees for so-called separatists, they are not going to negotiate with you. And it's very simple. And we have to be very honest toward these people. And when we are asking from, let's say, Abkhaz to be heroistically signing something with us, when they have a, uh, you know, gun barrel on their head, I mean, that's unrealistic. That's why we were demanding one very simple thing, international peacekeepers on occupied territories, international forces, which would give a prospect to peaceful negotiations with separatists. But it should happen with Russians going home. So we are not saying let's substitute Russian tanks with the Georgian tanks. We are saying the Russians go home, international forces come in, and then we solve the separatist problem. That's our methodology. And second part of the methodology is the engagement with the population residing on occupied territories. These are our people. We just cannot ignore. And we just cannot uh, sort of forget them and treat them as a Russian citizen. And we developed a whole strategy about engagement that uh, fortunately or unfortunately carries my name behind. Uh, and strategy is there. It should be implemented. We already started to implement some parts of it. And I think it has no alternative. And sooner or later, Russians will leave. Russians have a much bigger problem than Georgia. And in the Caucasus, they have huge problem for Northern Caucasus. So they better be focused on their own territory than uh, exporting problems to neighbors. 
they give a very long answer. Obviously, we, we can expand the, the discussion separate as you we have um, a few members from Spain here who are uh, dealing with uh, the issue of FETA for decades and uh, looking at the situation. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, the concern uh, in, uh, in Turkey vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kurdish uh, issue. But at any rate, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this uh, overview. Now I would like to open it up for uh, questions uh, from, uh, from the audience. Uh, please identify yourself. Don't be bashful. Uh, at any rate, so let me let me ask you another question. They have, uh, if you have answers, don't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> That's uh, also very useful. Yes, sir. Could you could you tell me? I, I, I think it's yeah, about here. enough. It's okay. Here is <coughs> Pat. Hi, Len. Maybe I'll not use this. Um, I have a question for you. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned your neighbors. Um, namely, you mentioned Armenia. I'm looking at these two countries, and uh, like my wife just recently, who visited your country, and said. Little oasis. We recently visited Armenia. Unfortunately, cannot say the same thing. Uh, without going into anecdotal histories and so forth, I'm trying to figure out what happened in Georgia versus Armenia. And I'm looking at the two countries as potential friends, potential alliances, both Christian countries standing next to each other, and yet there's not that openness or camaraderie. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Armenia is a very important neighbor for Georgia, and for many reasons, because historically we are next to each other, and obviously history was very different, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but nevertheless, you know, uh, Georgia has a tendency to love its neighbors. Uh, what is happening in Armenia is that because of the Nagorno-Karabakh problem, Armenia is talked into Russia's hands. Uh, houses Russian military base. Uh, it has an uh, unsettled relation with Azerbaijan. It has uh, largely, for the Karabakh reason, uh, obviously the issue of the 19 and 1915 is there, the Ottoman period um, uh, you know, events, but largely because of the Nagorno-Karabakh situation with Turkey is not settled as well. There was some attempts. So solution is to find the solution for Nagorno-Karabakh. Because when you have this kind of irritants in place, when you have a security dilemma, when you have problems like that, you are always dragged back from other issues to handle primarily the security issues. That's what we learned that you know you should put aside certain stories and certain issues and focus on yourself. And unfortunately, Armenia has no luxury to focus on itself and its development because it has many other aspects that plays in Armenian domestic politics. One is Karabakh. And there was a very famous joke that, you know that last Armenian presidents are from Karabakh. But there was a joke in Armenia that we give to Karabakh everything, you know, financial support, political support, military support, and what are the Karabakh is giving to us? And the answer was Kadres. They are sending you, you know, the people, the leaders. Uh, and uh, definitely Karabakh plays a role. Second very important factor is the Armenian diaspora. Let's not forget that the Armenian diaspora is one of the largest donors to Armenian state. And let's not forget that that diaspora largely cares about anti-Turkish things than pro more for Armenia. And we've seen it. And that's something that I'm constantly seeing them and telling them, and you have to get more serious about it, you know. Uh, giving money is very easy. Uh, but uh, when you play on international arena, you should have a positive agenda and not the negative agenda. Recognition of genocide is not a positive agenda. 
positive agenda can be linked only with the future of Armenian state. And when you see the struggle between Armenian government and the diaspora, uh, and in diaspora also you have a variety of people, it's not that one unified diaspora, you see that it's not really helpful. Third problem that you have there is a Russian military base, which is based there. If Karabakh is so, if uh, you know, relations with Turkey and Azerbaijan are settled, then Armenia will be very, very quickly developing, because we are talking about a very talented nation, historically talented nation. It's not just one of the nations. And Armenians know how to do business. But uh, being landlocked and being under security dilemma and having Karabakh on the soldiers, and having diaspora who have different agenda than Armenian government, it's not that easy to handle. So that's why, as a result, you have what you have. Uh, but what we have is 50, 60,000 Armenian tourists coming to Georgia. Because uh, it's very easy for them to drive. Nobody's going to stop them on Georgia and uh, take a bribe in every uh, 100 meter. Uh, I was told that before revolution to uh, reached Tbilisi from the border, either Armenia or Azerbaijan, you had to pay 18 bribes. And those kind of established places that you know that you are going there and paying bribes. And now you are not paying anything. Now we repair roads. So it's much more possible for them to come and enjoy the rest of Georgia. And look, uh, for us, it's vitally important that all our neighbors will be peaceful, and develop, because you cannot sleep well if your neighbor is angry and hungry. Uh, we believe that there is an enormous potential for Armenia to, to develop. Conflicts should be solved, and these conflicts are the biggest impediment for the region. What is your relationship? Uh, can I say first? Oh, Daphne Kameli, I'm a fellow here at the Atomic Institute. Uh, what is your relationship with your other neighbor, which is Iran, mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially in view of the um, uh, new developments there and uh, potential threats? Okay. Um, we. Sometimes we used to oversimplify, you know, and we like to hang the labels uh, on people and nations. And I know that in this city, Iran sounds quite scary. I was twice in Iran. I can tell you that these are rarely talented people, Iranians. They're very, very smart. They are historically smart people as well as Armenians. Um, they have a misfortune to have this kind of government that what they have. And uh, when I first went to Iran, I had a clear deja vu of Soviet Union. When you have a splitted life, one life for private and one life for public. And I asked the, the guide that we had, you know, uh, how popular is the profession of the hairdresser? And she said, very popular. I said, but who, everybody wears these red scarves and all of that, and who needs? I said, you don't understand that it, that's only for public. In private, it's a completely different story. And if you happen to be in the private part, I can assure you that's very popular for profession there, very popular. And uh, they are the number one consumers of the fancy lingerie as well. Uh, so you have, in Iran, very splitted society. You have a leadership that has seen a historic opportunity for them to win when Americans are overstretched everywhere, and the big prize for them will be getting footsteps very seriously in the Middle East. And you have a younger generation who doesn't really care about religious issues at all, and who is desperate to find way out. 
what we are trying to do is to keep the working relations with Iranian leadership that will not exceed anything that is sort of extra, normal as everybody else, nothing that would harm or violate uh, whatever embargoes or limitations are there, but also offering to Iranian people way out whatever they want to do. I'll give you a very funny example. Iranians have uh, famous singers that happen to live either in UK or US. Largely these are females who, whose dress code is not really intact with the requirements domestically. So they, can, they are not allowed to go and sing there unless they wear burqas. I don't know. But if you bring one of them in the region, you are getting 5,000 Iranians like this for the concert to come and listen to their beloved singers. This is tourism. We already have a direct flight from Batumi to Iran, and a friend of mine came from Batumi a couple of days ago in shock. He said, I saw Israelis and Iranians sitting together and drinking cafe, uh, coffee in the Batumi Cafe. And that's what we want to see in our region. If, if the Georgia is the place when Iranians and Israelis can meet and have a coffee and chat uh, without any uh, sort of problems, let it be. We like that kind of Georgia. Obviously, you will see some, you know, Cold War period Switzerland as well, the spies from this guy in that country <laughs> coming together as well, but who cares about those kind of things? We are doing exactly the same with the Northern Caucasus, that the Russians doomed as a terrorist. We opened borders, we abolished the visa regime for all North Caucasian republics. We have 4,000 crossing per day on Georgia-Russian border. And those who are doomed as a terrorist are coming in Georgia for education, for leisure, for trade, for tourists, for whatever. We never had even one criminal case related to that. So what is the alternative to block them in the ghetto and label them as criminals and terrorists, or to open Georgia for those who are normal and want to be exposed to something better? And I think our relation with Iran is fitting that paradigm that we have a working relations with government, not more than anybody else, and we have very intensive relations with people who see Georgia as a destination for many things, primarily for the Asian economy and tourism and whatever. Yes, sir. He's Georgian. Yeah, thank you. David Nukradze, I represent the Georgian television station, Moscow, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Ambassador Secretary Gordon on the line yesterday and said that there were some progress in Geneva talks, uh, but not enough, of course. I was wondering if you could give us some more details. Uh, what do you think? How successful Geneva talks is? Thank you. Uh, Geneva talks is uh, important for us for three different points of view. First of all, it's the only format that we talk to Russia. And we need to talk to Russians, even if we are adversaries, and we are in this stage because they are occupying our territories. We need to have a format to talk to each other. Now, how you talk? There is an old Jewish joke that how the wise Jew is talking to the stupid Jew. And the answer was, first of all, by phone, and second, from New York. <laughs> and. Uh, in the same way, uh, how you talk to Russians. You never talk to Russians face by face because they are too big and too, they can overpower you. So you talk to Russians in the format of international group and never in Moscow. <laughs> you talk to them in Brussels, in New York, in Switzerland, wherever. So it's the only format that we have to talk to Russians. That's first. Second, this format is underlined that parties to the conflicts are Georgians and Georgia and Russia. You have so-called separatists represented there as well, but as a community that is residing there, and you also have a representatives of exiled communities there. 
So parties to the conflict are Russia and Georgia. And third, I'm a strong believer that sooner or later Geneva talks will develop into the peace process. And it's the only format that has a potential to become a peace process. Now, when we are talking about some achievements, achievements are so-called IPRMs, Incident Prevention and Response Mechanisms. So these are ad hoc groups that have to address some incidents of the local uh, category, some shootouts or demarcation or landmines or crossing uh, administrative border lines and things like that. In that sense, IPRM mechanisms uh, were able to diffuse some tension till yesterday when Russians uh, shoot at uh, some Georgian kids. So IPRM is not a solution. It's a temporary measure to diffuse tension. But if you want to have degradation, then Russians have an ample arsenal in their KGB archives how to do it. And what is very unfortunate that Russians try to rely now on something that is called the state terrorism. We recently arrested some terrorists, unfortunately ethnic Georgians, who were recruited by Russian FSB officers in occupied territories, who were bombing alongside with critical infrastructure, like the railroad, electricity transmission lines. They were also bombing uh, some oppositionary, uh, opposition party headquarters. And guess what? What else they bombed? U.S. embassy. You don't know about it, but we have a very strong evidence, and your law enforcement agencies agree with our assessments, and we made all information available for them. So if they get that nasty that they try to bomb the U.S. Embassy, I think it's a high time to think about other parts of the reset that is not as shiny as uh, uh, Russians. And success. Yes, sir. I, uh, Matt, I'm a Thanks. researcher with the U.S. government. Uh, quick question. You mentioned the Russia's uh, North Caucasus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where do you see the region in five, ten years out? Do you see it more stable, less stable? Uh, which region? Northern Caucasus? North Caucasus. Oh. Uh, unfortunately, my predictions are not positive. Uh, and I'll give you some indications why not. We all heard that Russia is declining population-wise. They have a very serious problem with the birth rate. They have a serious problem with the life expectancy. Uh, and numbers that I hear are scary. I mean, they're losing almost a million people per year. And um, life expectancy for men, for example, is 53 years. When you have your 82 or something like that. 53 is that scary. And so you have a general decline of the population. But in the same time, you have a drastic increase of the population in the Northern Caucasus and in all Muslim republics. Drastic increase. And Russian demographers say that if we are not going to resettle these guys somewhere, in 20 years we will have a demographic catastrophe in Russian Federation. 15% of the uh, uh, recruits in the Russian army now are from Northern Caucasus. And these are not the easy ones to handle. They are demanding uh, halal food. They are demanding uh, you know, namaz uh, five times a day. They are demanding so many other things that Russians are not really eager or happy to match up with. The problem is that Russians do not really have a clear policy in the Northern Caucasus society. When I was talking to them and asking, what are you doing? They said, oh, we will fight in Chechnya till last Chechens. So they tried to kill them all. Now they are trying to buy them all. And none of them is working. And while none of them is working, they have a situation when number of the youth is drastically increasing. And we are talking about kids who haven't seen anything in their life but Kalashnikovs and, you know, warfare. And if you learn anything from Middle East or so-called Arab Spring, you learn that, you know, excessive number of unemployed youth is a very good recipe for revolution, revolt, or whatever. So 
in perspective, when Russians do not have a policy, but just throwing 7% of the GDP into the black hole and financing people like Kadiro, I'm not very optimistic. You see increased number of the Muslim radicals who are ready to blow up themselves, civilians, militaries, and etc. and etc. If you look at the statistics, every day somebody is killed, kidnapped, bombed, attacked, harassed, or something of that sort is happening. And we are talking about place when Russia declares already seven times victory. And we are talking about 300 uh, fringes of kind of uh, gorillas uh, running in the woods. And we hear that story for five years already. And guess what? The trigger will be Sochi Olympics, which is a golden opportunity for terrorists. And instead of coming to us and seeking our help, because that terrorism is our problem as well, because it's happening in our neighborhood and has a potential of spillover, they are occupying our territory. I, I think it's a bit irrational, but I never expected rationality from Russia. Uh -huh. so we have one in the back. Yes, please. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Amy Olson. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown, and I'm a registered nurse. I wanted to thank you for your clinical analogies on the headaches and the aspirin and the bleeding. <laughs> but I was wondering if you could speak to your healthcare system and some of your challenges and your objectives, and how the U.S. could perhaps help in a strategic alliance in your healthcare. Thank you. Uh, we recently had a huge healthcare conference, and because I was uh, not, uh, I was only appointed ambassador, I didn't present my credentials, I was not able to participate in the ambassadorial uh, you know, way, but I heard a lot of good things about it. Now, our healthcare is in uh, transformation, and somebody told me that. Uh, Changing uh, judiciary and healthcare is like uh, advancing on the graveyard. No uh, help is expected <coughs> because you have to do it yourself. Actually, there are no suitable formulas. Problem that Georgia has that we are trying to get rid of the Soviet legacy and Soviet healthcare system and uh, establishing the new healthcare system requires not only goodwill and political goodwill but a lot of resources. And it's a country specific. We discover uh, problems that uh, we only now are trying to handle. For example, we discovered, I don't know the, the right abbreviation of the something resistant tuberculosis, drug resistant tuberculosis. The, you know what I'm talking about. And largely, that tuberculosis appears in the penitentiary system. Now, while we are trying to switch to the system of uh, insurances uh, and uh, private insurance companies that provide the health care, uh, otherwise you are subsidi subsidizing, and we are very much against subsidizing the whole health care system, we are trying to switch to generally uh, system of uh, what is it, insurance companies and areas that government have to take a lead, that government will take a lead, like that kind of tuberculosis, like the mental hospitals, like the HIV AIDS uh, areas. And there are areas that only government will be able to handle because uh, no insurance company will give you insurance on this kind of diseases, so it cannot be commercial. So it's a matter of social responsibility of the government. Uh, and it's a very serious dilemma, because uh, to cure somebody with HIV AIDS, uh, no, not to cure, but to sustain, uh, it's, uh, as I was told, it's about $16,000 a year. And you have a dilemma. You have a criminal sitting in a prison in the penitentiary with HIV AIDS and you're going to spend $16,000 on that person or you have to give it to, as a pension to pensioners that have been very good citizens for entire their life and they contributed to society. 
it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, from a moralistic point of view, I know the answer. But when you are government, you just cannot say that this matters and it doesn't matter. And that's a serious problem. So in this transformation, we are trying to more share the burden with population, that they should not go to doctor when they have a clinical case, but they have to take care of their health care prior to going to doctor. And in Soviet Union, people were going to doctor only in a quite final stages of when you really have to take out your teeth or something like that, not to something like it's very common here every year checking was not common in Georgia or any other places of Soviet Union. Annual checking, what are you talking about? And we are trying to not only introduce the technicalities of better equipment, uh, better management, better hospitals, but also educating people about their responsibilities, about their health care. And there are areas where we make enormous progress, like in equipment, but there are areas that there are a lot of things that we have to learn, especially in managing healthcare. Because that is something that we can learn from you. Healthcare management is a, I don't know, the philosophy of its own requires a very specific knowledge, and we unfortunately lack that kind of knowledge. You can buy you know, x-ray, and that's easy. But to educate somebody who can properly use it, and then the doctor who can properly read it, it takes much more time. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, if I may ask uh, one final uh, question. Uh, if you put your physicist uh, at um, we all know the position of the United States, particularly President Obama. The goal, at least, is to have a world uh, free of nuclear weapons. Uh, as academics, uh, one, one of the projects that uh, we're involved with uh, NATO and the international community is uh, the Middle East uh, uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone uh, idea. And I wanted to, to ask uh, your opinion about that. Uh, do you, as a physicist, as a diplomat, uh, do you think, uh, looking at the Middle East now, uh, the turbulent Middle East, and um, do, you, do you think that uh, this is one approach to have a constructive engagement uh, between uh, the, uh, the parties, or is it a time to sit back and to wait and to see how uh, things uh, develop uh, on the ground? If you ask me if a dirty bomb is possible, I'm telling you, yes, it's possible to make. Uh, is it easy? Absolutely not. Can terrorist organizations make it? Absolutely not. You really need a very capable state behind it. If you don't have a capable state behind it, you know, some uh, smart kids cannot make it. You need uh, very many very important ingredients that are not on the market. So if you are not a state, there is no way that uh, somebody can make it. So if uh, Al-Qaeda bombers can make the handmade, uh, you know, explosives from the handy materials, you cannot make a dirty bomb in the same way. So that's why the nuclear non-proliferation issue is focused not on Al-Qaeda kind of organizations, but rightly it's focused on the states that may sort of leak that kind of stuff to some terrorist organizations. Now, if you look at the NATO uh, priorities, these are very interesting. NATO said that it's the major challenges are nuclear non-proliferation, organized crime, and failing states. Okay? Now look at Georgia. Georgia was a failing state that effectively fought that problem. Georgia is the only country so far that 
radically eliminated organized crime domestically. And I already told you that we are considered the safest nation. And you have to remember that in Soviet Union, 80% of the criminal bosses were originated from Georgia. From one particular city of Kutaisi, why? I don't know. But 80%, even now, the, all the mafia bosses in Russia are Georgians. Or, or they were born in Georgia. Um, and country got rid of them at all. We don't have any of them. We have a law that it for, it prohibits even songs about them. Uh, and when we are talking about organized crime, we have to see other versions as well. Georgia was a failing state because we had this Abkhazia and South Society issues. There was an interesting case when your FBI intercepted the contrafact dollars in Virginia. And when they came with a chain, they ended up in South Society because these dollars were produced there. So when you have these gray areas, these gray areas are becoming source not only for instability of the nation, the Georgia state, but also it affects you here because they produce your dollars. And more than that, we intercepted uh, nuclear material smuggling coming from occupied territories. Guess where it only originated, obviously, in Russia. So, and we are talking about more than one kilogram, around two pounds of enriched uranium. And not one or two cases, several cases of that sort. So if the NATO priority is fighting organized crime, this and that, why Georgia is not a member, member of NATO? It's about performance? No, it's about hypocrisy of some European states. I don't want to go into details. Uh, and naming and shaming business. But uh, we all understand that if these nukes are not coming from Russia, there are no ways these guys are going to get it. That's simple. Uh, so fighting terrorism is never ending story. Uh, only successful case of fighting terrorism that we learn from history was the story of sect of assassins. And uh, actually the world was coined after that sect. Uh, assassins were first um, suicide bombers. This was a specific, a specific sect in Persian Empire, actually, who were going and killing somebody, the, the dignitaries, knowing that they will be killed as well. And they were proud, their mothers were proud that their kids were doing that. So what we, the phenomenon that we see now in the Middle East as well, that you know, going and blowing up in the, uh, civilians or whatever, and yourself, and then hoping for 72 or whatever regions there. Assassins were defeated only when the nest of assassins was completely eliminated. And that's how that sect disappeared. So if you are not going to completely eliminate nest of origin of this kind of behavior, you are not going to win it. Can you eliminate it? I don't believe that you can. You can fight Al-Qaeda. You can fight, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Taliban. You can fight here and there. And they pop up in different forms. And then they are called political parties, Hezbollah, Hamas, Hezbollah Tahrir, Muslim Brotherhood, and you, in your democratic manner, will embrace them. And uh, that's a very sad story, but a realistic story. So you will be in fighting all the time. And what is important that you will not be setting, uh, acting according to their agenda, you should have your agenda, and they have to be on the retreat and not you. So, but if you allow semi-democratic games, like we are going to see now in Egypt, you will end up legalizing terrorists. <coughs> and when you have a head of the national uh, security research something saying that uh, uh, Hamas is largely, po no, Muslim Brotherhood is a largely uh, political organization, you are in trouble. And that's what is happening in the Middle East. I mean. When you are at war, you don't say, well, I believe that uh, Gaddafi is going to survive. What is that? Since when Americans behave like this? And when president is saying that Gaddafi should go, he should go. 
and you make everything that he will go, and not withdraw your planes in the middle of operation. Sorry for a little bit of criticism, but uh, uh, that is the America that the world got used to. When Americans say something, it happens. And that's not only good for you, it's very good for the rest of the world. So terror is going to stay for a longer period of time. Uh, with this kind of approach that you have now, you are not going to eliminate the nest of the terrorists, and it requires the complexity, and complexity is not there. And uh, when uh, European cows are more subsidized than children in Africa, you will always have disparity. And every European cow, uh, government spend uh, two or three euros, which is four or five dollars, and people in Africa cannot even make one dollar per day. It's, there's no justice in this world, only in some areas. Unfortunately. Did you have a question? Anyone? Please. Thank you. Maya Kay from Voice of America, Georgian Service. Can you please expand a little bit more about the future outlook of U.S.-Georgia and strategic partnership? What are the plans? What are the odds of Georgian integration into NATO? I think that Georgian integration in NATO is inevitable. I think that American bases in Georgia are inevitable. I think that uh, strategic partnership uh, in more areas between Georgia and the U.S. are inevitable, and these are inevitable for very practical reasons. Uh, Georgians are the most pro-American nation in whole entire neighborhood. Yesterday we heard the very scary stories that only 10% of you know, strategic partners of America, Turkey, approve relationship with uh, America. And popularity of America is down to 10% in Turkey. Measure it in Georgia, it's 80 something. Don't tell me that Russians love America. We know that, you know, um, in Russian perception uh, of uh, enemies, number one enemy is America, number two is Georgia, and number three is China. So we are occupying very prominent <laughs> place between these two huge countries. Uh, so, we are the most pro-American in the region. And if you will, 75% of the world resources are in Eurasia. All the conflicts that you are going to see will be in the next 50 or 70 years in Eurasia, largely, largely in Asia than Europe. So we are talking about America that is in every possible sea in the world that you can imagine. So, and Americans, have to have a stronghold somewhere close in the vicinity, in the region, to reach out. Whatever operations they will have, military, social, economic, uh, political, whatever. And Georgia is kind of perfect place for that, for any sorts of operations. And it's in our interest as well to host Americans in all these capacities, because it's increasing our security, it's increasing our democracy, it's increasing our economy, and we generally believe in the same values that Americans believe. So this is the uh, not only a beacon of democracy, but this is the country that pragmatically is pro-American and pragmatically understands why Americans should be successful in the world. Not because of uh, some Sarkashvili and his leadership, but I'm talking about population. So. I think it's inevitable. How long it's going to take, I honestly don't know. But I'm telling you that I am trying on that direction every day. <laughs> Ambassador, if I could, uh, you spoke of addressing things from a positive thing. Uh, you mentioned the 2014 Olympics. Mm -hmm. So she has also been named as one of the host cities for the 2018 uh, FIFA World Cup. Mm -hmm. as well as the Formula One racing location for the Russian Federation uh, through 2014-2020. What are the positive aspects that come, can come out of the visibility of that city 
relative to the regional approach? Um, by default, all the events that you just listed are the positive events and should be disconnected from politics and should be disconnected from anything else because we are talking about sport, we are talking about uh, you know, joy and about adrenaline, adrenaline of watching these competitions. And you better have a sportive competition than a military competition. But we are also talking about areas of sports that Unfortunately, what we learned from the recent publications are the most corrupted. And how Russians got agreements to host this kind of events in Russia, a lot of European newspapers are speculating about. But I don't want to touch that part. I want to touch the importance of search. First of all, for why, for the God's sake, you want to have a Winter Olympics in the summer resort? <laughs> that part I still don't understand. Second, if you ask the Circassians, having Olympics in Sochi, it's having, uh, you know, Olympics in Dachau, because they were exterminated in mass by the Tsarist Russia, and drastically changed the demography of that region, and indigenous people were exiled from their homes and were killed in masses. And recently, we found documents in our archives that are horrifying. Russian officer is reporting to its commander that, you know, we have, I don't remember exact numbers, but we have 4,000 uh, Circassians on the ship, and the ship will leave only, you know, uh, have to leave tomorrow. Uh, we have a shortage of food. If we will wait another two days, most of them will die, so then we will have uh, less people to transfer. Methodology. Okay, let them stay another two days, they will die, and so they will let Trump transfer them. It reminds me what Nazis did, honestly. Uh, Nazis had the exactly the same approach. So if you ask the Circassians, for them it's uh, outrageous. Now, if you ask to, <laughs> you know, terrorists, that's a golden opportunity. It's not that we are asking them anything, but by all assumptions, these are the golden opportunity for North Caucasian terrorists. Now, if you ask the Russians, it's a, then a very different story. For them, it's an event of pride, if you, uh, event of this, event of that, how great we are, we are hosting this, we are hosting that. In reality, the most expensive Olympics, winter Olympics that we've ever seen are uh, Olympics of Vancouver that cost $3 billion. Guess how much the Sochi Olympics going to cost? Guess. Probably more than that. More, but how much more? Double. Double? You are very optimistic. $30 billion. For a town of 300000 they have to build much for this. Okay. Then we go to the vision from Georgia. $30 billion? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, by $30 billion, I can build three Georgias probably. Uh, the problem is that we all understand that Sochi Olympics in this kind of dollar bills is nothing else than money making for individuals, not for the state, event. As one of your very prominent scholars told me, the Skolkovo project in Russia is a real estate project and not the uh, brain development. And if people are claiming there that one kilometer of the road costs $200,000, and we built recently roads, and I can tell you it's for $70, $700, something like that, but not 200000 somebody made the calculation that with that amount of money you can have a certain layer of caviar or certain uh, layer of foie gras, uh, instead of asphalt, uh, and, and, and 200,000, it's insane. But when we look from Georgia, you see very interesting picture. What you see from Georgia, that Russians actually cannot build it. 
And they cannot build for one very simple reason. They don't have an infrastructure to import building materials. They don't have a roads. They don't have ports. They don't have railways of enough size and capacity <coughs> to import building materials. They don't have it domestically. They have to bring it somewhere, unless they bring gravel by airplanes. I mean, they can if they want to, but how? How they are going to build? And if you are talking about people in the Central Olympic Committee, they start to understand that Russians are lagging behind construction. They dig out the holes and trenches, but then what? On top of that, they don't have a working force. They have to bring about 50 or 60,000 you know, construction workers in a city of 300,000. And they have to house them somewhere, somehow. Where and how, this question is not addressed yet. They approach the Central Olympic Committee that can we house people on the cruise ships? Because they are not able to build enough hotels. And they said, no, because it's a winter Olympics. There are storms. So how you can imagine having sportsmen in the shaky you know, cruise ships? And I think that that's the biggest challenge that Russians have. Not only a price of it, they have one. Not only a corruption, it was always there. Not uh, uh, only the security. I mean, this way or other, they will be handling them in a very brutal Russian way. Not the Cherkes because Circassians because they are very feudal. But practicality is that they are not able to build it. Unless they will find some kind of solution with us and we'll use our ports and our railways. That could be the positive. Or negative. They either have to negotiate with us or occupy the rest of Georgia. Both but, options are open. But you are talking if you're negotiating, <laughs> as you said. Yeah, we'll be happy to negotiate, but we <laughs> have to learn some things there. Understand. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Appreciate Thank it very you. much. The uh, Ambassador touched on a, uh, a criticism of the United States, and uh, mm -hmm. we can take that to heart. But I think many Americans here in the room have, uh, have heard that criticism before. And uh, in different environments, uh, could possibly have wished a little bit more forceful approach from, from our side. Uh, but as the ambassador said, uh, this is a complicated world. And uh, how things are done and what's said uh, on a practical sense, at a government sense, from an economic sense, uh, the complexity abounds. So uh, you, you've given us much, uh, much to think about today. Appreciate your perspective, and uh, we thank you all for coming today. Please uh, travel safe, and uh, once again, investor, thank you very much.